so Canada and BC, what are the implications for us here, aside from the fact that we do care about what happens in other parts of the world, and the fact that in one world, ready or not, as William Grider's beautiful book title says and explains, um, you know, we do care, and if water is going down in one place, it's going to be affected everywhere. But let's talk for a minute about here. First of all, I cannot strongly enough repeat that the United States is getting terribly thirsty. And it's an issue that some states are really nervous about. I was in Vermont in the summer working with the Vermont Natural Resources Council because they are bringing in groundwater protection legislation for two reasons. One is the big uh, bottling companies are all over uh, New England uh, getting water. Uh, licenses for water, but also they want to establish that this is Vermont's water when California says, hey Vermont, we always loved you, you know, because <laughs> they know that this is going to come. We have uh, the Ogallala Aquifer is being depleted at 14 times faster than it can be replenished. They are growing uh, alfalfa and cotton in the desert. They're, they're, you know, Las Vegas is booming. They're building in, in Nevada. They're building a, a, a nacre. Every minute is going up. It's not sustainable. These are future ghost towns unless they are able to secure massive new water systems from somewhere else. And uh, there is no national protection in our country. Let me say this as strongly as I can. No national law that protects our water either ecologically or politically. The only agreement we have signed around our water is NAFTA, which says that water is a good and an investment, so that if we start exporting our water to the U.S. for commercial purposes, we can't turn the tap off. Same provisions that, re that apply for uh, oil, our energy, and we, just to tell you, when we first signed the proportional sharing agreement on energy, we were sending 25% of our gas and oil production to the U.S. We're now sending 70, 70% of all our production to the U.S. It is not Canadian energy anymore, it's North American energy. And the same would happen to our water. Similarly, NAFTA has a provision that says that um, an, invest, uh, an investor here has rights. For instance, the big American uh, energy companies working in the Athabasca tar sands where there's an enormous amount of being, water being not only destroyed but lost to the hydrologic cycle forever in that mining operation. If uh, either the government of Canada or Alberta were to say to uh, these companies, well, I'm sorry, you've got to stop destroying water tables, they wouldn't be allowed to do it. They would, or they would have to be prepared to pay financial compensation under Chapter 11, because these are investor rights that exist now, not in some future time. So this is the only document, cross-border document, uh, that, that really establishes our relationship on water to the United States. We have not banned the bulk export of water. We're depending on um, provinces to voluntarily do that. And I wouldn't wait much longer uh, before I ex expect a, the exports may be starting from, from this province and several others. And I have to tell you, a new study finds that we don't even know where the groundwater is in Canada. There was a leaked report last year from Environment Canada to the Canadian government and it said basically it's pathetic, you're not taking care of our water, you have no idea where it is, you don't know if we're sustainably using it or not, it, we know we're polluting it, and there is absolutely no ecological or, or, or political protection for it. Now here in British Columbia, I have to tell you in my opinion there is open season on your water systems by private companies aided and abetted by government. Bill 30 has set the stage for the planned granting of 600 private power licenses, which starts off being about hydro, but ends up being about control of lakes and rivers. And some of this is going to go for sale in the United States. Uh, we're, I think we're going to start to see, or are beginning to see, the pieces being put in place in this province, and it's happening elsewhere, but it's it most strongly here, just like private health care is, is, is most strongly present here, here in Quebec. Uh, I think what we're going to see is the move to private control and ownership of, wa of bodies of water, including the resource, resorts that come into the province. And, and uh, I think we're going to see a move away from public ownership and public control of water to private water rights and, and the and private sale. We're also, of course, watching companies like Epcor and Corex, who used to be um, Terrison, um, coming in to run infrastructure, wastewater systems, and so on. 
although we've had some great wins in the province, most recently um, when people in Whistler stood up to a proposed privatization of a big new expansion of the wastewater facilities there, uh, the city council was forced to move back to holding it in public control. So there have been some really good fight backs, but I really, what I'm watching and seeing and reading and hearing in British Columbia is that there's a sea change here, and this, your water systems, everybody's beginning to understand, you don't have to just look at Tofino, you know that there's, the amount of development, the speed of development is hurting water systems here, and people are dividing into those camps, you know, that we've seen in the third world, between, well, turn it over to the private companies, and they'll set, the, they'll set prices, and therefore, uh, that will make people use their water less. And I wanna say, I'm not opposed necessarily to pricing or taxing for water on, as long as it's in the public realm and no one is denied it uh, because they can't pay. But if you're controlling water in the public realm and you're charging for it, you're taking that money to rebuild infrastructure, to clean up faulty systems, to clean up polluted systems, to make sure everyone has access. If it's a private company that's charging it, that money is going to go to profit to its shareholders. That's what it's for from the beginning. And it's also important to remember as we privatize these hydro systems and these public systems, that any exemption from American companies coming in and running our systems under NAFTA is gone, because that's only applicable as long as we're uh, running these systems, including, by the way, healthcare in, the, in, in public. And finally, just on Victoria, I want to say that it's very, very good, of course, um, that the city is now going to be uh, treating its waste and not putting it um, directly into the ocean. <laughs> Our friends to the south of us thank us. But I have to warn you that the same struggle is going to take place. It's a very big project. It's a very, very expensive, intensive infrastructure project. And the private sector interests are going to be all over it. And it's really important that the people of Victoria stand up and say, we have to keep local control of our water. What has come out with study after study after study, whether it's so-called first world or third world, is that when the water companies move in, and I'm not blaming them, this is what their job is, they take profits from people who need it. They raise the rates of water because they have to get profits for their shareholders. They do not put the kind of quality care back into conservation and into uh, basic uh, wastewater treatment programs. I mean, their record is there for everyone to see. Don't even listen ideologically to any of this. Just look at the straight facts. A big transnational corporation is in business to make money. It comes into your community to make money. If it can make money, it will. If it cannot, it will leave. And the stories about these companies leaving failed projects and leaving the public purse to pick up after them are legion. Uh, including Atlanta, Georgia, where the pro-privatization city council just last year, two years ago now, canceled a 20-year contract with Suez after they'd just been there three years. For many reasons, the rate of, of water had dramatically gone up, the water coming out of the taps was brown, the pro-privatization council suddenly became, same people, totally anti-privatization, and they've been left to try to clean up the mess and to rebuild. Don't do it in the first place, I think, is the, is the argument. I want to end with a couple of thoughts, and then I think we're hoping to have um, time for a, a dialogue. Uh, I guess the one thing I want to say to you have really strongly is that we are building a wonderful global movement. I see, and many people see, that there are two potential futures for water in our world. One is growing conflict between countries, between regions, between rich and poor, between urban and rural, between indigenous and non-indigenous, between people and nature as we impose more and more into nature. Another reason not to privatize, who's going to buy water for nature, you know? Uh, and that we're already seeing around the world. Uh, you know, I'm, we're seeing divisions within communities around uh, around this, the desperate search for water. Uh, on the other side is the possibility, this is the dream that I have, is that water will become nature's gift to humanity. 
to teach us how to live in peace with each other, finally, and to live in peace with the earth, and to recognize that we are, in fact, just a species like other species, and the earth could do just fine without us, but we will not do just fine without clean water, and we will take down other species with us if we don't care for that water. So we have to place ourselves back inside nature, and we have to be more humble, and we have to be more careful, and we have to be more respectful, and we have to do things differently really quickly if we're going to reverse um, the massive destruction of water systems. And I tell you, you think you live in a water-rich country, Technically, yes, we have about 20% of the world's water, but it's in lakes or mighty rivers running north. We only have about 7% of the world's renewable freshwater resources, and we are not caring for them. We're, we're expecting massive droughts on the prairies coming up soon. We are destroying water tables in the Athabasca region, uh, and we are, of course, developing far, far too quickly in too many communities and living with the consequences as the people of Tofino know. So this notion that there's unlimited water here is not true. We are the water stewards for this water. We are this generation's keepers of our water and we simply and, 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 and clearly have to do better. So in, in your deliberations this week at this wonderful and important conference, thinking about how cities can be more, ur urban environments can be more nature friendly, can, un can be more uh, cooperative with, with rural communities and so on, how indigenous, non-indigenous peoples have to work together as we deliberate all of these things. Remember that you're doing this as a backdrop to a whole movement around the world. And this movement's working very hard to establish certain fundamental principles about water <clears throat> as a public trust, as a human right, as something that should be excused <clears throat> from the market system. Uh, because it's, uh, as my friend from Texas said, it's just so damn obvious, he said, it's just something different. And I would end with, with um, two of my favorite sayings. One is um, the four laws of nature from the great American environmentalist Bowerman. And he said, four laws of nature are these. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything is connected. Everything goes somewhere. And nature bats last. And And my favorite quote, because, and this was from Tolkien, it was my favorite quote before the film, Lord of the Rings, but it is about stewardship. And I, I think anybody who's come out on a Saturday night to talk about this is, sees him or herself as a steward <clears throat> of our water, of our nat natural systems. Not just water, of course, because we all know that we have to keep all of our systems intact. The forests are the, the lungs and the wetlands are the kidneys of our water systems. And if we destroy either or both in significant numbers, there's no amount of law that's going to protect our water systems. We have to have integrated ecosystems. And I think I'm in a room full of people who are committed to doing this. So I'll end my formal presentation with these beautiful words of Tolkien. He says, the rule of, uh, sorry, the rule of no realm is mine but all worthy things that are in peril, as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail in my task if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward, did you not know? Thank you very much. As a friend of mine said, I used to think that they were well-intentioned and ill-informed. And she said, you know what, I don't think that anymore. I think they're well-informed and ill-intentioned. And I'm really, <laughs> she said, I just really think that they know more than they say they do. And, and the innocent look um, is not real anymore.
think your question is extremely important, and uh, that's why I th I th if we could have um, a collective kind of consensus that we want to keep water public, and it will be democratically publicly controlled, then when you have these discussions about how you do pricing, uh, then you're keeping it within that public system and it's not being priced for um, the private sector and for shareholder profit. Uh, I think we need a combination of, um, of laws. Uh, Martin Luther King said, legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. Isn't that the most wonderful thing you ever heard? Legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. So for the heartless in our world who don't care, who waste water, who see the common, pro, the common, the common uh, commons of water as something that because you can't stop them, they can do what they want to it, we do have to have laws. Very, very quickly, what we know we need to do is change from uh, uh, agriculture that is based on chemicals, corporate and industrial uh, based agriculture to sustainable agriculture. That is probably the single most important thing we can do in the world. So the whole concept of farming and agriculture is absolutely key to water. We, there's a wonderful book by a woman named Sandra Postel called Pillar of Sand where she describes how many civilizations have been destroyed by massive flood irrigation overuse of land the way we're doing in, in so many parts of the world now. Uh, not uh, regenerating land, not allowing it to regrow, not allowing the soil to become fertile again. Uh, and of course now with these intensive livestock operations, we're, we're also polluting water, we're not just using it badly. Um, so the number one waster and destroyer of water in the world is poor uh, corporate farming practices and, and we are moving that direction, all the wrong direction in Canada in terms of these intensive livestock operations. Susan Howard, our uh, national water campaigner, uh, today told the, the other conference that there are more pigs in Canada than human beings. So. Just a, a thought there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and, and then uh, secondly, right behind it is, is, is poor corporate industrial practices. Um, everything from the creation of um, uh, computer chips and cars. Uh, there are just terrible ways in which we're uh, methane gas um, production, uh, mining the way we destroy table, groundwater tables with poor mining practices. We need very strong laws. We need a national water act in this country that sets out what people no longer can do. The multi-point, what they call multi-point pollution has got to stop and, and voluntary codes simply are not working. That, that's kind of on a macro scale. What we can do within our cities and communities, of course, is that we can bring in laws and regulations and requirements that people will have to use less water. You go to Australia, where I'm going in a couple of weeks to uh, open a great big huge land care conference. I mean, they don't ask whether you're rich or poor or whatever. Stay in a five-star or one-star hotel, you don't get a lot of water when you turn the water on. It's all regulated now because they're running out. So they are using their water much, much differently, and we have to start thinking that way. This is an island. There is going to, you're going to run out of water on this island. It's not just a case of pumping deeper and finding new sources of water. We are going to find that unless we collectively care for water in places like Vancouver Island, we simply are going to run into problems, and then you either say, well, some people will be able to buy it, <clears throat> and others won't, or you say collectively, we're going to take care of it, and there are ways you can do that through pricing, yes, through taxes, yes, through laws and regulations and, and, and things people cannot do anymore, uh, yes, but it, again, if it's controlled within the public system, then those resources that you gather are there to rebuild infrastructure. On the issue of bottled water, I so agree with the comment. Um, there, are bottled water and Coke, of course, are all over universities and high schools now. Coca-Cola gets the um, the exclusive right in many, many schools to deliver, uh, you, you know, your your drink. Coke, by the way, says that it claims that it is now providing 10% of the TLI, the total liquid intake of the world, and they say that they will be providing 20 or 25% of the total in liquid intake within a certain number of years. I mean, they've actually, and they're doing real well, you know, because they've got exclusive, you know, Fly Air Canada 
It's Dasani water, it's Minute Maid uh, orange juice, Minute Maid is Coca-Cola. I mean, these companies do this. And Coke, by the way, and Pepsi just use tap water. They pay money, a little bit of money, to a municipality. Then all the municipalities are looking for money. And they take water, and for every final pro uh, bottle product, a bottle of water, they are destroying or discarding it, a, an equivalent of two because they put it through this process of osmosis or whatever and add their secret mineral packet. But it's just basically tap water. So um, yeah, we have to really expose this. And I'd like for us to start talking more and more about uh, boycotts of bottled water, except, of course, when a community is in need because there has been uh, you know, a problem, such as in, in Walkerton. Uh, and, um, and I would like for us to um, be talking about uh, Coca-Cola as well. Uh, on roof gardens, yes, thank you for that. Um, roof gardens are much, much more common, of course, in Europe. And I was privileged to take a tour of some communities around um, uh, the Lake Constance in Germany two summers ago. They had a water festival, and I was, I was just, I have a crazy life. I was taken to all these different communities around Lake Constance, because it's actually, a, not this isn't your question, but it's a separate um, story. Lake Constance was totally polluted um, 10, 15 years ago, and the, the countries that surrounded, I think there are four of them, came together and they've cleaned it up so much that they claim, now I don't know that you'd want to do this, but they claim you can put a cup down into, into the lake and drink it. They're so proud of, of coming together and reclaiming this totally lost lake. But anyway, they're very, in this community, they're also into roof gardens and into gathering water, terracing water where we know where uh, forests have been cut down. Uh, people are having to find ways to capture water that got captured when you had forests. It's one of the reasons the ice caps are melting and the glaciers are melting because you're, you, there, there's no place for the snow and the ice to get caught when you have uh, too much clear cutting. So yeah, the roof gardens are, um, uh, I hope something that you'll talk about at this um, wonderful conference. And there are just so many creative ways that we can do things if we come together and we make a decision. But you have to start with the knowledge that you, or the commitment that you're going to change your relationship to water. And remember that not only is it the same amount of water in our world that was here at the creation of the planet, it's the exact same water that's just gone round and round and round. Next time you walk in the rain, stop and think that some of that water ran through the blood of dinosaurs, because it's actually absolutely true. It uh, gives you a feeling of having a responsibility. <laughs> you know, better pass it on for the dinosaurs when they come back, when we're extinct, right? <laughs> On the, the sewer and water and EPCOR and three Ps and, and how do you what do you do to um, you know to bring uh, more knowledge? First of all, when these the way that the private companies take over is that they do come in and start taking over infrastructure and wastewater first because that's the part that people aren't watching. They tend to be watching their drinking water and that's more something that they can see. Well, why should I pay for drinking water? And so the way the private companies are coming in is taking over, is, is through, partly through this Bill 30 and the, the, the uh, beginning of private licenses on rivers and, and lakes here, but also through getting these private contracts. A 3P, the idea is supposed to be that it stays in the public, uh, uh, control stays with the public and the company takes the risk. But inevitably, this is not the way it happens. The investment is always made by the public. It's always made by either local government or, in the case of third world countries, the World Bank. The companies put very little money because it's not in their interest to invest very deeply in case it does not work. And again and again, we find these private companies are not putting money in. What happens is if there's a problem, they take off and they leave. If they're not making money, if they run into problems, or if it's costing more, or if they're fight, finding local resistance, they leave. The best example I can give you is not so much on water. It's on a bunch of private, a big private school system led by a guy named Edison, or the company was called Edison. 
and this was a few years ago, and they got a lot of uh, federal money, public money and, and local money, to run this for-profit system of high schools, and the parents would top up so it would be public money plus private money, very much like, a, like what they're looking at with the private health care system here. And the company invested badly, and it went bankrupt. And one weekend, they just moved into their dozens and dozens of schools across the country in the US, and they closed. They just had these trucks come up and just take all the computers and everything. Uh, they just stripped the schools. When the kids came to schools Monday, school Monday morning, there was nothing left inside. And who, how do you go after them? They've gone bankrupt. So the, the, you know, even if a company is not intending to be you know, irresponsible or whatever, in the end, because you're dealing with water and it's a public service, you need to take, keep control. They have to make enough money to pay money to their shareholders. So somewhere there's going to be uh, you know, corners cut in terms of the quality of, of maintenance, cutting public sector jobs, whatever. They have to cut somewhere to take the same amount of money that the public system would use and make not only enough money to provide the service, but to make a, a profit. And in terms of who to go to in your community, if there's no argument, go to CUPE, Canadian Union of Public Employees, go to Island Water Watch, and go to the Council of Canadians. These are groups who have come together to form a coalition who could help you with materials and hold a town hall meeting and start the discussion. Because truly, I feel in this province it's going to, it's, it's happening, just as it's happening with healthcare, I think it's happening in a way that we're not seeing with, with water. see exactly the, the problem that you're having, which is you don't want to deny water, but if you bring water in for development, then you're going to create the development that's going to create more stress on your water. And I can just tell you then the, the large picture, we're going to have to start talking about limits to development or the kinds of development that we're uh, accepting. Uh, Uh, the mayor of Duncan today uh, was very, uh, very beautifully spoken in, in, at this conference, got up and said, look, I don't suppose I'm going to get re-elected for saying this publicly, but we got to question this unlimited growth. And, and I quote the same, the same environmentalist who gave the four laws of nature also said that um, unlimited growth has the same DNA as the cancer cell. And that is it has to turn on its host and kill it in order to survive. This notion of unlimited growth, and that is the basis of globalization, of economic globalization. More, more you know, planes and more stuff and more goods and more cars and more everything. Buy more, consume more, take down more forests, use more energy. It's, it's not sustainable. And if anything is going to put the limit to it or the brakes to it, it's not energy, it's water. We simply don't have the water resources to continue to to expand in this way with the, with the, with the kind of development that, that um, and the kind of farming practices and agricultural practices that we are uh, involved in. So I, I think for you to talk about what is sustainable, I think we need to have certain language that we're going to use over and over again. And sustainable uh, within nature is, is one of those key words that, that's going to have to be absolutely um, a key. <music> Again, on the person who asked about zoning bylaws on, on water, absolutely. We're going to have to look at the limits to water when we give new licenses for new resorts or not give licenses and the okay for new resorts. I mean, I just took the, the uh, beautiful drive, the Sea to Sky Drive to Whistler, but I, you know, you can just feel it's just being, it's going too fast, <laughs> you know? And you've got the Olympics coming and, and um, you know, the development that's going to happen there. They were telling us in Whistler that with the, even without the Olympics, that they're, they're just, they're, they've pushed their, their water systems and their, their treatment and their infrastructure to the wall. So we, I think these questions are enormously important. Land use, of course, and limits to land use, but we're going to have to start putting water in the center of these questions, and I thank you for that. Virtual 
water, the term virtual water refers to water that is used to make a product that you're importing so that you don't have to use up your own water systems. And the prime example is Japan being a very wealthy island that isn't able to, doesn't have much water, uh, has a good wa public water system by the way, um, is brings, it, it imports most of its beef, it imports its wood, it imports uh, it, it, so many of the things that it uses that, uh, that it consumes that are water intensive. And this is just beginning to be an issue that uh, third world, first world, global south, global north is beginning to talk about. Use up your water systems in the poor countries, who cares? Use it to make the products that you ship to us. So when we look at whether you have water resources, we're more and more going to have to look at the whole issue of, of, of virtual water, including the, the trade in, in food. question about human rights. I am terribly distressed that my government, my Canada, voted against the right to water and has not recognized the right to water in our own laws. We have no national law or national constitutional um, language that guarantees the right to water. And I think you're going to find that more and more you're going to hear from rural communities, from poorer communities, from indigenous communities in this country about their rights and the rights of people who are not either wealthy or in large urban centers to have water, water for food, water for, uh, water for life. It's one of the campaigns that we have is called Water for Life. Another is called Water for All. You can hear the languages where as we're uh, you know, creating a language around this, it's very clear what we're trying to do. And the whole issue of the right to water is one that I'm hoping we're going to raise in this country. We need a National Water Act that protects the quality of water, that protects the integrity of ecosystems, that um, brings in that question of water limits in every way, uh, that um, explores where our groundwater and our groundwater takings are taking place and so on, but we also need uh, political protection from our, for our water, from um, commercial sale, commercial bulk export, from private takeover, uh, and uh, from the abuse of, of water as a human right. The government says, well, some of them say, well, we didn't want to sign the, the concept of the, the human right to water um, because it might mean that then the, the United States would come and take our water because it's their human right. They know full well that the, any language at the United Nations around right to water is about poor people's right to be, tr to be serviced by their own government and that it would never require Canada to physically share our water, and most particularly with the United States. In fact, the same government that won't sign the right to water signed water away in NAFTA. I think the real reason is that consecutive Canadian governments have not wanted to give away the right to sell our water when the time comes. And I think it's around the corner that this issue is going to be upon us. And I think it's appalling that we have had no uh, debate in this country around um, our precious water resources in a world that's in water crisis. And here we are just uh, oblivious to, uh, to this. So yes, we need this. Yes, we need a debate. Yes, we need to be passionate. Yes, we need to be water warriors. And as a very dear friend um, from uh, this part of, of the world, from Vancouver Island said, reminded us, and I'll just end with, with her, her lovely admonition, when you get weary about fighting for social justice, just take a deep breath and remember that you have to do it because that's just the way it is. Or she would say, uh, fighting for social justice is like taking a bath. You do it every day or you start to stink. So she'd say, don't stink. <laughs>